this body of work and calling the intimacy of care and like much of my work is um, originate in the domestic sphere, homes and families and internal processes and yeah, starts here and then kind of goes out and then it starts well and out. So this, this particular cycle um, is called domestic thread and I go a little chronological this is what I was working on two years ago, so the fall of 2019, yeah, so like that, 2019, um, just before the pandemic. And at that time, I was already thinking about um, what happens be be behind closed doors. Um, the man, one of the things that always strikes me as so absolutely mind-blowing is the finding that the least safe place for women around the world is the home. So with this body of work, um, I meditated on that, on this fear um, in the home that often women create for families, for themselves included, that's for their children, for their partners, um, for the extended family, and the idea that to this day, women are so threatened in their own homes, I find astonishing, and that that is true around the world, um, regardless of the um, prosperity of a country. Um, it, it's just, it seems to be kind of inherent in human organization, social organization, um, social sexual organization, I don't know. Uh, so, a lot of them, of these, all of these pieces deal with, in various ways, with feeling um, either that somebody, I often think, like, for example, this um, centerpiece is the sacrifice. Maybe I talk about one piece in more detail and then a few questions later. So, I think that in many family systems that don't function well behind closed doors, one, um, at least one family member gets sacrificed to keep the peace in the family. And um, sometimes that um, it can be kind of <laughs> happen in different dynamics. My experience was that it was um, a lot around um, shared meals that um, basically one would observe and that person was then kind of the sacrifice of the night. And the, um, the blindfolds, which I have used repeatedly, which is funny to me now to look at these blindfolds where we all run around with masks, but at the time it was a blind, meant as a blindfold, like this, I think often unhealthy family systems, um, everybody's aware of what is going on, but there's a certain looking away, and it's not only in families, it's um, on larger scale too, and I think most larger larger scales are echoes of the family dynamic in some way or another. So the family is like this microcosm. So it's this public kind of offering in the center of the family and the looking away, which I think maintains a lot of, when we ask like, how is it possible that we still live with that? For me, then let's just say next, um, the body of work over there is about going into the pandemic. So just after I finished that, I had shown this, this work at UMass, everything shut down. And I realized very acutely this um, subject matter I had just worked on over the past half year um, had took on a whole new dimension by all of a sudden everybody actually being stuck at home, not, not being able to go out, not being able to escape children, not being in school, warning signs not being seen. So. Actually, in Rhode Island, our governor addressed that publicly, repeatedly, and um, was pretty um, outspoken about it. But when you think how much we have heard about this funding and the fighting about the funding, I have heard nothing to increase the care for mental health of abused um, women or children or elderly. Or what happens now? How do we process these populations who were caught? with their abusers. I haven't heard a single word, um, but I've heard a lot of arguing about I want this and I want that and I don't know what I want. 
So for some reason, as a society and as a supposedly developed society, we stick to this blindfolding, we stick to all agreeing, yeah, um, there are millions of children and women who are actually elderly, and, and men and boys. There are millions of people among, working amongst us who get regularly, live in an abusive environment on a regular basis, and we all have agreed, not all, but we have largely agreed as a society to look away or to blindfold us because it does not get the attention and it hasn't gotten the attention post-COVID on a large scale that it deserves and needs. So this is a little bit how, it, how I walk into COVID. And then when COVID struck and we are always supposed to stay at home, I had just taken this show down as just briefly just before and then, um, then I had to a little bit of my brain <laughs> in a panic because I'm president of Hera and was like, oh God, what happens now to Hera? How are we paying our bills? And so we started fundraising with the help of the board. And yeah. So there was a moment where we just all restructured. And then at the end of March, I started um, growing every day. Um, just really out of whatever kind of moved me. I think as an artist, the way I work, because I work very intuitively, um, my psyche is my, is my resource center. Whatever flows and whatever I digest in my drawing, I kind of spit it out again. So in a way, I felt that that was my way. You know, it's like, as Mara said, like, I also hit this point, like, what am I actually doing here? Then can I be a nurse? Can I be a social worker right now? <laughs> um, and of course, we couldn't all uh, switch professions in that moment, according to me, and we were just supposed to stay home. So I used that to share on social media every, every day a drawing. And I did it for 100 days, which brought me exactly to a, July 4th. And at July, on July 4th, in America, things had improved, had loosened up. My kid went back to camp in a modified way, but it, it, things happened again, and there was a sense of, well, maybe something starts to flow again and get better. And then the so those hundred drawings I kept in the format of digital because that's how I shared them at the time. And the drawings that are the paper drawings here on the drawings on paper on the wall I did this spring. And the hundred drawings at the time, the year before, really just flowed out of me. They just spilled out of me. There was so much such an intensity in this moment of time that we shared, we seemed to largely share this intensity in some form or another. And this spring, I just got it, like, I felt that wherever we turned, we talk, it was, we talked about anxiety, we saw anxiety, we felt anxiety. It was an absolutely anxiety with time. So, in these drawings, I, I worked out of this anxious space, really, and I left it a lot of things out of space, and it was hard to finish things, nothing just flew but on its own. Everything was like, oh my god, what's the next? Try to do this, try to do that. So there's so anxiety written and so non fluid. They took more time than hundred drawings the spring before. So in that sense, um, my work is really a record of what I absorb in my immediate and in my wider world. Try to translate that to um, to create a record of this moment in, of this moment in time and the psychic tension or vibration I pick up. And of course, there are many others. I just pick them up from my particular classes.